Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to get into another round of questions today. Always remember just to stick straight to God's Word. If you can't prove it in the Bible, don't believe it. You know those at Berea in the book of Acts, they studied the Scriptures daily. And, you, and that's what everyone has to do. I mean, that's the least we could do is make at least a few minutes a day at least to study our Father's Word. Think about how incredible it is. The Creator of all the universe, of heaven and earth, of our very souls, He gave us His Word. He gave us an instruction manual on how to be happy, how to be blessed, how to be successful, how to be pleasing to Him, how to live forever. I mean, just think about that, how incredible that is. Many people, they don't even read it. They go through this life with a whole lot of problems and no peace of mind. We are truly so blessed, but you have to stick to the Word. And you know 2, Thessal or 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. You don't want to be ashamed. You don't want to be confused. So stick to God's Word. Let's get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yeah, of a Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. All right, first question. We don't know this person's name. Can you please explain to me this scripture? What does Jesus' judgment being taken away mean? Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 33. And it's saying how, um, and I'll read it right here. I have it written down. It says, In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. But of course, you know, Christ was crucified, but three days later he resurrected. But he, he, his judgment was not fair. He was perfectly innocent. He never sinned, but they condemned him to death. So yes, his, uh, his judgment was taken away, completely false judgment. Just ab and it's, um, that verse is even quoting Isaiah chapter 53, which gives you detailed prophecy of the crucifixion hundreds of years before it ever even happened. Only God could do that. Tammy from Virginia. Those who say they are a prophet, but are not, but in the last days God says He will raise up prophets. Can you help with this? Well, there's no scripture that says in the last days God will raise up prophets. Certainly not that's worded like that. I think you might be thinking of Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, where it says, In the last days the Spirit will be poured out on all flesh, and sons and daughters shall prophesy Old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions. And yes, when Satan's here as the false Christ, the elect will be delivered up, and they will allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. But if someone comes telling you they're a prophet, I, why would you listen to them? Read Ezekiel 13. Read Jeremiah 23. And there are many other Bible verses that say to beware of false prophets. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 31 says, Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. People go around all the time saying, Oh, I'm a prophet. God told me to give you this message. I have a pro This is what so many say. I have a prophetic word for you. Bunch of liars. Don't be deceived by false prophets. If you can't prove it in the Bible, don't believe it. Share me from New Hampshire. Is the two sides of paradise a separate place from heaven where the good side can talk to Father? Jesus said that the one malefactor would be with him in paradise, not heaven. I just wondered, I hope it doesn't sound stupid, but either way, you're with God anyway. No, no question is stupid as long as someone's truly sincere and asking a question. So no, not stupid at all, but paradise is heaven. And Jeremy speaking of the gulf of Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. So no, that's not a separate place from heaven. That is heaven. Everyone, when they die, you see it in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. When your flesh body dies, your spirit returns to dirt, and the flesh returns to God who gave it. 
And so everyone, when they die, they either go to one side of the gulf or the other, as you see in Luke 16. So, no, that is in heaven. I also want to mention two scriptures here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So if when you're absent from this body, you are present with the Lord on one side of the goal for the other in heaven. But like Paul would also say something similar to this. I believe it's in Philippians chapter 1, how he lets you know, like, yeah, I would love to be with Christ right now, but we have work to do in the flesh. If you're still in the flesh, God has work for you to do and you do it. Also, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, that's Jesus Christ, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Clyde, we don't know where Clyde's from. If they follow the Bible, and then why are they calling yourself Christians? And then he said some more that was like blasphemy that I'm obviously not going to read. But there, I wanted to answer this because what he's saying is that the Bible doesn't say anything about the word Christian. Well, of course it does. Acts chapter 11 verse 26 says, And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Well, what's it mean to be a Christian? It means you believe in Jesus Christ. And that's the only way to eternal life is to believe in Jesus Christ. Also, Acts chapter 26, verse 28, this is what Agrippa said to Paul. He said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But you know, almost doesn't cut it. And then also one more scripture that mentions the word Christian specifically. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16 says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on, his, on this behalf. It's an honor to suffer for Christ's sake. You know, Luke chapter 6, it says, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that's what they did to the false prophets. So yes, you will be persecuted at times. People aren't going to like you at times because you serve Jesus Christ. Who cares? Your reward is great in heaven. And just like it says in Galatians, I believe it's chapter 3, verse 24, the law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus Christ. All throughout the Old Testament, we got prophecy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I already mentioned Isaiah 53. There's Psalms 22, gives you pr prophecy of the crucifixion. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, the following verses, and over and over and over. And Christ has always been, as you see in John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. So yes, the only way to eternal life is to be a Christian, is to believe in Jesus Christ. Mark from California. Why wasn't the book of Enoch in the Bible? And should we study it since it pertains to the election? And I know what he's saying, the election. He's saying God's elect. Well, it doesn't pertain to the election or God's elect. It doesn't per it's not God's word. It's completely false doctrine that was written by man. That's why it's not in the Bible. And uh, all you have to do is read it. And no, I completely recommend not studying it. It's completely false doctrine. And, but, uh, and yeah, the first few chapters, you might say, oh, hey, this might be right. I mean, you can already tell it's not. But when you get to chapter 13, that's where it all unravels completely. Where it tells you that after the fallen angels came and seduced women, then uh, the judgment was set forth that they were damned, which that's all true. But then it says that they tried to repent. It says that they were sorry for it, that they tried to receive uh, forgiveness for it. That's a lie. The fallen angels are evil. They knew exactly what they were doing. It's, the, the book of Enoch makes it seem like, oh, they did this, but they didn't really know what they were doing. But then so they were sorry for it afterwards. That's a blatant lie. False doctrine. Also, you get to chapter 19. It says that the women became sirens. That, that, that's mythology. That, that's a lie. Then you come to all-out blasphemy when you get to chapter 33 where it says the, the tree of the wisdom of knowledge of good and evil, you know that's Satan. Genesis chapter 2 and 3, Ezekiel 31. And it tells you in Enoch 33 that it talks about how Adam and Eve partook of that tree. But you know what it says right before that? 
It says, but people partake of that holy tree and they receive great wisdom. Do you understand that's blasphemy of the worst kind? It's saying that to partake of Satan is holy. Absolute evil, absolute false doctrine. The book of Enoch is one of the most wicked. It, it doesn't get any worse, really. It's not God's word at all. It's false doctrine. You know, I have to say, anyone that reads that and they don't know it's false doctrine, you got big problems. I'm talking to anyone. Not just Mark. I'm not just trying to come down on him. I'm talking about anyone. If you think you know God's word and then you read that false book of Enoch and you think that's God's word, then you really don't know God's word. I mean, how could you expect to not be deceived by the false Christ if you can't even tell that difference? What does Satan do? He takes truth and he twists it. Just like when he quoted Psalms 91, he twisted it and made it false. So stick to God's word. That's, it's not God's word at all. The book of Enoch is not. Maggie from Florida. I got an apocrypha for additional study. Do you have any videos to better help studying using the apocrypha or a cheat sheet or something? And no, absolutely not, because it's full of false doctrine once again. I, I brought it. I'm going to read just a little bit of it to show you how false some things in the Apocrypha are. First of all, I'm going to go to 2 Ezraus. I'm going to go to 2 Ezraus chapter 7. I'm going to read about verses 25 through 28 here. Anyone who has read God's Word should instantly know this is false doctrine. 2 Ezra chapter 7. Let's pick it up in verse 25, I think is about where I want to pick it up. I'll pick it up in about verse 25 of 2 Ezra chapter 7. Therefore, Ezra, the empty have emptiness and the full fullness. For behold, the time will come, and it will be that when the signs come which I have foretold to you, the city that appears as a bride will appear... And the land which is now hidden will be seen. So a city that appears like a bride. That sounds like Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 2 so far. And then it continues. And, who, and whoever is delivered from the evils I have predicted will see my wonders. For my son the Christ will be revealed with those who are with him. So kind of okay so far, right? Even though it's, it's really kind of mixing the third earth age up with Christ's return. But so okay, we're kind of so far. Talking about Christ is going to return. But watch what it's about to say. For my son, the Christ, will be revealed with those who are with him. And he will make glad those who are left in 400 years. Well, that's certainly not biblical. You know when Christ returns, there will be the thousand-year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. Scripture says nothing about 400 years in connection to this, but now is next thing is where it completely goes completely astray. And it will be after those years that my son Christ will die. Whoa! This is saying Christ is going to return, then there's going to be 400 years, then he's going to die? That's blasphemy. And all who draw human breath. And we don't need to go further. You could if you wanted, but I mean, that's absolutely false doctrine. Any way you want to slice it. I want to also, I'm going to read the little introduction to the book of Tobit. And I'm going to read a scripture in Tobit. Well, it's not scripture actually, but I'm going to read you some words from the book of Tobit. This is what the little introduction to Tobit says. It says, the, and so this is what, I think this is what the guy who um, translated this specific apocrypha, I think these are his words. This is what it says. The offer of this skillfully constructed and charming piece of religious fiction has adapted and combined the story of a high car of which the Aramaic papyri of the 5th century B.C. have found in Egypt, the story of the grateful dead of which there is an early version in Cicero, D. Divinashi 1.27, and the Egyptian tractate of Khans. And there's more, but I, it's religious fiction. It's not a mystery that it's religious fiction. Now turn with me over to chapter 6. I mean, you don't have to turn with me. You might not even have an apocrypha. I don't, I don't blame you. But so um, I'm going to read. This is Tobit chapter 6. I'm going to pick it up in about verse... Um, i pick it up in basically verse 1. So, And they went on their way and came toward evening to the river Tigris, and there they spent the night. 
And the boy went to wash himself, and a fish jumped out of the river and would have swallowed the boy. But the angel said to him, Take hold of the fish. And the boy seized the fish and threw it up on the land. And the angel said to him, Cut the fish up and take its heart and liver and gall and keep them safe. And the boy did as the angel told him, and they cooked the fish and ate it. And they both traveled on until they drew near Ekbatana. And the boy said unto the angel, Brother Azariah, what are the liver and heart and gall of the fish good for? Now is where it, you're going to see why I'm reading this. And he said to him, As for the heart and the liver, if anyone is troubled with a demon or an evil spirit, you must make a smoke of them before the man or the woman, and they will be troubled no more. And as for the gall, if you rub it on a man who has white film over his eyes, he will be cured. Now, have you ever read something like that in God's Word? Of course not. How do you have power over evil spirits? Through the name of Jesus Christ. Not from fish guts. That's not God's Word at all. I want to read one more little thing. I want to go to the book of uh, the wisdom of Sirach. Chapter 2, or chapter 12, I mean. The wisdom of Sirach, Sirach chapter 12. I'm going to read about verse 1 through 6. If you do a kindness, know to whom you are doing it, and you will be thanked for your good deeds. If you do a kindness to a godly man, you will be repaid, if not by him, yet by the Most High. Good so far. The man who persists in evil will not prosper, nor the man who will not give to charity. Give to the godly man, and do not help the sinner. Well, that's not what God's Word says. Jesus Christ came to save the lost. We are supposed, and if someone's going completely the way of evil and of Satan, you don't say what they're doing is right. But we're supposed to, that's who we're supposed to share the gospel with anyone. Verse five: To con do kindness to the humble-minded, and do not give to the ungodly. Hold back his bread and do not give it to him, so that he may not come to control you with it. For you will experience twice as much evil for all the good you do him. For the Most High hates sinners and will take vengeance on the ungodly. Give to the good man and do not help the sinner. Absolutely contrary to what it says in Romans chapter 12. You know what Romans chapter 12 says? It says, give your enemy food. Give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And yes, that is God's wrath. But even more importantly on that, when you are good to your enemies, that can convict people. That can bring them to Jesus Christ. And then it also says in Romans 12, Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I also mention, like, um, so it's basically agreed on by all scholars that all the Apocrypha was written somewhere between 400 B.C., and um, 100 A.D. even. And that's not a necessarily a 100% fact, but that's, what, that's basically an agreed upon thing. But men can be wrong. But, uh, so I want to mention that because like, you have the wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha. Well, if the Apocrypha was not written any time before 400 B.C., that's way after Solomon was alive. And, it's our, and basically everyone that is a scholar will even tell you that it wasn't actually written by Solomon. But I'm going to mention like the prayer of Manasseh. It's very short. There's not really any false doctrine in it, except I will say it says that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob did not sin, which of course we all sin. But the argument could be made that it was just saying that they did not do evil like Manasseh did. So I'm not going to... I'm, I'll just say that. but So I want to say that because there's not really any false doctrine in the prayer of Manasseh. So I'm not just going to flat out say that every word in the Apocrypha is false doctrine. Because there's some truth in it. But we, you know the things that we just read in Tobit and Sirach. You know that's false doctrine. And I'm, I certainly do not believe that a single word of the Apocrypha is God's word. And so... I think hopefully I answered that well enough. I don't think I really need to go any further on that. So stick to God's word. And oh, I, I want to mention this too. I have to mention this about it. So yes, the Apocrypha was in the original 1611 King James Bible. 
And it was in English translations even before that. But it was, it's, you know why it's called the Apocrypha? Because it was not originally canonized. From the very beginning, they didn't think it was God's Word. But it stuck around, you know. And then, yeah, it was in English translations. It was in the King James 1611. But then they took it out. And I think very rightfully so. I mean, you know there's false doctrine in it. We just proved there's false doctrine in it. Like I said, I don't think a single word of the Apocrypha is God's word. But so I just wanted to say that because so many people, they say, oh, it was in the 1611. It's all God's word. Well, have you ever even read it? Anyone that would say that? There's false doctrine in it. I don't think a single word of it is God's word. And I don't think we need to go any further on that. Richard, we don't know where Richard's from. Is the treasury of Scripture knowledge a good tool to use for help with students? It's absolutely incredible. And I know I've mentioned it one time before. I use it every single day. And it's not any commentary by man or anything like that. It's just you go to a Scripture and it'll give you other Scriptures that connect to it. I love what it says on the website. It says, over 500,000 Bible cross-references created by many scholars over many centuries... It reveals how Scripture interprets itself. And you hear me say that often. God's Word proves itself. I'm going to just give you one example. When you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it will mention when you go to the little part that's without form, it will give you four Scriptures. Job chapter 26, verse 7. Nahum chapter 2, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. And Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. And Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, you know what that will prove to you? That God did not create the earth without form and void. He created it perfect, but it became without form and void. And that's what happened when God destroyed the first earth age because of Satan's rebellion. And then in that Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, in the following verses, it, gives, it um, teaches you about how God destroyed that first earth age. You can read about that Satan's rebellion in the first earth age in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19. But yes, that treasury of scriptures, like I said, it's not a single word from man. It's just you click on a scripture and a little phrase in the scripture. It will give you other scriptures that connect to it. I use it every single day. It's absolutely one of the greatest tools that God has ever given us. One more question. We don't know this person's name. Do you think Enoch has a role to play in the end times slash five months? So let's get to what the actual Bible says about the book of Enoch. I think it's very possible that Antipas of Revelation chapter 2 will be Enoch. Let's mention a couple of things about the book of Enoch. Or not about the book of Enoch, sorry. You know the book of Enoch's false. Let's mention a couple things about in the Word of God about Enoch. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. And you can read about how Enoch was taken um, in um, Genesis chapter 5. He was only on earth for, in his flesh for 365 years. So he did have that testimony. Now, Revelation chapter um, 2, verse 13, this is what it says about Antipas. And it, well, first of all, it's speaking to the church of Pergamos. So this is what it says to the church of Pergamos. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, that Satan's throne that you also read about in Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 16. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So this is a future prophecy. When Satan's on earth as the Antichrist, and he sets up his throne, there's going to be someone named Antipas, who is going to be martyred. And I think it's very possible that that will be Enoch. And you know, so let's mention the two witnesses for a second. Revelation chapter 11, you read about them. You see, they're going to be doing the same things that Moses and Elijah did in the past. 
You know that Elijah never died. And you know in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, it says that um, God buried Moses. It says no one knows of his sepulcher to this day. Well, why? Because I think it's very clear that God took Moses. And also in, Revelation, or in Matthew chapter 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration, who showed up where there with Jesus Christ? Moses and Elijah. So I think it's very clear, I think in God's word, it's very clear that Moses and Elijah will be the two witnesses. So then many people do ask about Enoch. And you do know that, um, you know that um, the two witnesses, they will be martyred three and a half days before Jesus Christ returns. And I think it's very possible that Enoch will be that martyr Antipas. I don't know that for an absolute fact, but I definitely think that's very possible. I have to mention that, um, yes, there are those three specific martyrs that are mentioned. But some people think, oh, Satan's going to come killing millions of people. Well, that's not true at all. How does he destroy? He by peace shall destroy many. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. He's coming disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. But it is true, the two witnesses will be martyred and Antipas will be martyred. I want to mention one more thing. It's interesting in that um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, where it mentioned Antipas. And the very next verse, it mentions Balaam in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Then another scripture where you read about um, Enoch is Jude chapter 1, verse 14. Just three verses before that, it mentions Balaam as well. So that's at the very least interesting. Like I said, I don't know for a fact that Antipas is going to be Enoch, but I think that is very possible. Enoch had a testimony before. I think it's possible he's coming back as Antipas to have a testimony once again. All that matters is what God's Word says. Like I said, don't take that as fact, but what you can take as a fact is all these things that we just mentioned that are written in the Scriptures. So study it on your own. Make your own decision. No matter what, stick to God's Word. If you can't prove it in the Bible, don't believe it. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yeah, Ave, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your Word. We just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name, amen. Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.